welcome to the Dread Familiar. It has been said there are three sorts of people. Those who are alive, those who are dead, and those who are at sea. This is episode 10 of the Dread Familiar. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to everyone who has contributed to the show so far. If you would like your stories or voice auditions to be considered for future episodes of the show, send them to me at submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the show if you haven't already, and make sure to check out some of the other great shows on legionpodcasts.com, of which this show is a part. Tonight's episode features the first half of a tale written by F. Marion Crawford. It was originally published in The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean, the 1886 issue of Unwin's Christmas Annual. The tradition at the time was to tell ghost stories at Christmas, the most famous of these being, of course, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which was originally published about 40 years earlier. Uh, Crawford was an educated, well-traveled man whose short stories contributed to the development of the weird fiction genre, whose most famous author, in retrospect, is H.P. Lovecraft. This genre greatly influenced, or arguably evolved into, the horror genre as we know it today. Tonight's tale doesn't contain any moments of overt horror, but it is unsettling nonetheless and it sets the stage for the more harrowing second half. So, I bring you The Upper Birth by Francis Marion Crawford, Part 1. Somebody asked for the cigars. We had talked long, and the conversation was beginning to languish. The tobacco smoke had gotten into the heavy curtains, the wine had got into those brains which were liable to become heavy, and it was already perfectly evident that unless somebody did something to rouse our oppressed spirits, the meeting would soon come to its natural conclusion, and we, the guests, would speedily go home to bed, and most certainly to sleep. No one had said anything very remarkable. It may be that no one had anything very remarkable to say. Jones had given us every particular of his last hunting adventure in Yorkshire, Mr. Tompkins, of Boston, had explained at elaborate length those working principles by the due and careful maintenance of which the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad not only extended its territory, increased its departmental influence, and transported livestock without starving them to death before the day of actual delivery, but also had for years succeeded in deceiving those passengers who bought its tickets into the fallacious belief that the corporation aforesaid was really able to transport human life without destroying it. Signor Tombola had endeavored to persuade us, by arguments which we took no trouble to oppose, that the unity of his country in no way resembled the average modern torpedo, carefully planned, constructed with all the skill of the great European arsenals, but, when constructed, destined to be directed by feeble hands into a region where it must undoubtedly explode, unseen, unfeared, and unheard, into the illimitable wastes of political chaos. It is unnecessary to go into further details. The conversation had assumed proportions which would have bored Prometheus on his rock, which would have driven Tantalus to distraction, and which would have impelled Ixion to seek relaxation in the simple but instructive dialogues of Herr Ollendorf, rather than submit to the greater evil of listening to our talk. We had sat at table for hours, we were bored, we were tired, and nobody showed signs of moving. Somebody called for cigars. We all instinctively looked towards the speaker. Brisbane was a man of five and thirty years of age, and remarkable for those gifts which chiefly attract the attention of men. He was a strong man, the external proportions of his figure presented nothing extraordinary to the common eye, though his size was above average. 
He was a little over six feet in height and moderately broad in the shoulder. He did not appear to be stout, but on the other hand, he was certainly not thin. His small head was supported by a strong and sinewy neck. His broad, muscular hands appeared to possess a peculiar skill in breaking walnuts without the assistance of the ordinary cracker, and, seeing him in profile, one could not help remarking the extraordinary breadth of his sleeves and the unusual thickness of his chest. He was one of those men who are commonly spoken of among men as deceptive, that is to say, that though he looked exceedingly strong, he was in reality very much stronger than he looked. Of his features I need say little. His head is small, his hair is thin, his eyes are blue, his nose is large, he has a small mustache, and a square jaw. Everybody knows Brisbane. And when he asked for a cigar, everybody looked at him. It is a very singular thing, said Brisbane. Everybody stopped talking. Brisbane's voice was not loud, but possessed a peculiar quality of penetrating general conversation and cutting it like a knife. Everybody listened. Brisbane, perceiving that he had attracted their general attention, lit his cigar with great equanimity. It is very singular, he continued, that thing about ghosts. People are always asking whether anybody has seen a ghost. I have. Bosh, what, you? You don't mean to say so, Brisbane. Well, for a man of his intelligence. A chorus of exclamations greeted Brisbane's remarkable statement. Everybody called for his cigars, and Stubbs the butler suddenly appeared from the depths of nowhere with a fresh bottle of dry champagne. The situation was saved. Brisbane was going to tell a story. I am an old sailor, said Brisbane, and as I have to cross the Atlantic pretty often, I have my favorites. Most men have their favorites. I have seen a man wait in a Broadway bar for three quarters of an hour for a particular car which he liked. I believe the barkeeper made at least one third of his living by that man's preference. I have a habit of waiting for certain ships when I am obliged to cross that duck pond. It may be a prejudice, but I was never cheated out of a good passage but once in my life. I remember it very well. It was a warm morning in June, and the custom house officials who were hanging about waiting for a steamer already on her way up from the quarantine, presented a peculiarly hazy and thoughtful appearance. I had not much luggage, I never have. I mingled with the crowds of passengers, porters, and officious individuals in blue coats and brass buttons, who seemed to spring up like mushrooms from the deck of a moored steamer to obtrude their unnecessary services upon the independent passenger. I have often noticed with a certain interest the spontaneous evolution of these fellows. They are not there when you arrive, five minutes after the pilot has called, Go ahead! They, or at least their blue coats and brass buttons, have disappeared from deck and gangway as completely as though they had been consigned to that locker which tradition unanimously ascribes to Davy Jones. But, at the moment of starting, they are there, clean-shaved, blue-coated, and ravenous for fees. I hastened on board. The Kamchatka was one of my favorite ships. I say was because she emphatically no longer is. I cannot conceive of any inducement which could entice me to take another voyage in her. Yes, I know what you're going to say. She is uncommonly clean in the run aft. She has enough bluffing off in the bows to keep her dry, and the lower berths are most of them double. She has a lot of advantages, but I won't cross in her again. Excuse the digression. I got on board. I hailed a steward, whose red nose and redder whiskers were equally familiar to me. 105 lower berth, said I, in the business-like tone peculiar to men who think no more of crossing the Atlantic than taking a whiskey cocktail down at Delmonico's. The steward took my portmanteau, greatcoat, and rug. I shall never forget the expression of his face. Not that he turned pale. It is maintained by the most eminent divines that even miracles cannot change the course of nature. I have no hesitation in saying that he did not turn pale, but from his expression I judged that he was either about to shed tears, to sneeze, 
or to drop my portmanteau. As the latter contained two bottles of particularly fine old sherry presented to me for my voyage by my old friend Snigginson Van Pickens, I felt extremely nervous, but the steward did none of those things. Oh, I'm d d d he said in a low voice and led the way. I supposed my Hermes as he led me to the lower regions. It had a little grog, but I said nothing and followed him. 105 was on the port side, well aft. There was nothing remarkable about the stateroom. The lower berth, like most of those upon the Kamchatka, was double. There was plenty of room. There was the usual washing apparatus. There were the usual inefficient racks of brown wood, in which it is more easy to hang a large-sized umbrella than the common toothbrush of commerce. Upon the uninviting mattress were carefully folded together those blankets which a great modern humorist has aptly compared to cold buckwheat cakes. The question of towels was left entirely to the imagination. The glass decanters were filled with a transparent liquid faintly tinged with brown, but from which an odor less faint, but not more pleasing, ascended to the nostrils, like a far-off seasick reminiscence of oily machinery. Sad-colored curtains half-closed the upper berth. The hazy June daylight shed a faint illumination upon the desolate little scene. Ugh, how I hate that stateroom. The steward deposited my traps and looked at me, as though he wanted to get away, probably in search of more passengers and more fees. It is always a good plan to start in favor with those functionaries, and I accordingly gave him certain coins there and then. I'll try to make you comfortable all I can, he remarked, as he put the coins in his pocket. Nevertheless, there was a doubtful intonation in his voice which surprised me. Possibly his scale of fees had gone up and he was not satisfied. But on the whole, I was inclined to think that, as he himself would have expressed it, he was the better for a glass. I was wrong, however, and did the man injustice. Part 2 Nothing especially worthy of mention occurred during that day. We left the pier punctually, and it was very pleasant to be fairly underway, for the weather was warm and sultry, and the motion of the steamer produced a refreshing breeze. Everybody knows what the first day at sea is like. People pace the decks and stare at each other, and occasionally meet acquaintances whom they did not know to be on board. There is the usual uncertainty as to whether the food will be good, bad, or indifferent until the first two meals have put the matter beyond a doubt. There is the usual uncertainty about the weather until the ship is fairly off Fire Island. The tables are crowded at first, and then suddenly thinned. Pale-faced people spring from their seats and precipitate themselves towards the door, and each old sailor breathes more freely as his seasick neighbor rushes from his side, leaving him plenty of elbow room and an unlimited command over the mustard. One passage across the Atlantic is very much like another, and we who cross very often do not make the voyage for the sake of novelty. Whales and icebergs are indeed always objects of interest, but, after all, one whale is very much like another whale, and one rarely sees an iceberg at close quarters. To the majority of us, the most delightful moment of the day on board an ocean steamer is when we have taken our last turn on deck, have smoked our last cigar, and, having succeeded in tiring ourselves, feel at liberty to turn in with a clear conscience. On that first night of the voyage I felt particularly lazy and went to bed in 105 rather earlier than I usually do. As I turned in, I was amazed to see that I was to have a companion. A portmanteau, very like my own, lay in the opposite corner, and in the upper berth had been deposited a neatly folded rug with a stick and umbrella. I had hoped to be alone, and I was disappointed, but I wondered who my roommate was to be, and I determined to have a look at him. Before I had been long in bed, he entered. He was, as far as I could see, a very tall man, very thin, very pale, with sandy hair and whiskers, and colorless gray eyes. He had about him, I thought, 
an air of rather dubious fashion. The sort of man you might see in Wall Street, without being able precisely to say what he was doing there. The sort of man who frequents the Café Anglais, who always seems to be alone, and who drinks champagne. You might meet him on a race course, but he would never appear to be doing anything there either. A little overdressed, a little odd. There are three or four of his kind on every ocean steamer. I made up my mind that I did not care to make his acquaintance, and I went to sleep saying to myself that I would study his habits in order to avoid him. If he rose early, I would rise late. If he went to bed late, I would go to bed early. I did not care to know him. If you once know people of that kind, they are always turning up. Poor fellow. I need not have taken the trouble to come to so many decisions about him, for I never saw him again after that first night in 105. I was sleeping soundly when I was suddenly waked by a loud noise. To judge from the sound, my roommate must have sprung with a single leap from the upper berth to the floor. I heard him fumbling with the latch and bolt of the door, which opened almost immediately, and then I heard his footsteps as he ran at full speed down the passage, leaving the door open behind him. The ship was rolling a little, and I expected to hear him stumble or fall, but he ran as though he were running for his life. The door swung on its hinges with the motion of the vessel, and the sound annoyed me. I got up and shut it and groped my way back to my berth in the darkness. I went to sleep again, but I have no idea how long I slept. When I awoke, it was still quite dark, but I felt a disagreeable sensation of cold, and it seemed to me that the air was damp. You know the peculiar smell of a cabin which has been wet with seawater. I covered myself up as well as I could and dozed off again, framing complaints to be made the next day and selecting the most powerful epithets in the language. I could hear my roommate turn over in the upper berth. He had probably returned while I was asleep. Once I thought I heard him groan, and I argued that he was seasick. That is particularly unpleasant when one is below. Nevertheless, I dozed off and slept till early daylight. The ship was rolling heavily much more than on the previous evening, and the gray light which came in through the porthole changed in tint with every movement according as the angle of the vessel's side turned the glass seawards or skywards. It was very cold, unaccountably so for the month of June. I turned my head and looked at the porthole, and saw to my surprise that it was wide open and hooked back. I believe I swore audibly. Then I got up and shut it, as I turned back, I glanced at the upper berth. The curtains were drawn close together. My companion had probably felt cold as well as I. It struck me that I had slept enough. The stateroom was uncomfortable, though, strange to say. I could not smell the damnness which had annoyed me in the night. My roommate was still asleep. Excellent opportunity for avoiding him. So I dressed at once and went on deck. The day was warm and cloudy, with an oily smell on the water. It was seven o'clock as I came out, much later than I had imagined. I came across the doctor, who was taking his first sniff of the morning air. He was a young man from the west of Ireland, a tremendous fellow with black hair and blue eyes, already inclined to be stout. He had a happy-go-lucky, healthy look about him, which was rather attractive. Fine morning, I remarked by the way of introduction. Well, said he, eyeing me with an air of ready interest, it's a fine morning and it's not a fine morning. I don't think it's much of a morning. Well, no, it is not so very fine, said I. It's just what I call a fugly weather, replied the doctor. It was very cold last night, I thought, I remarked. However, when I looked about, I found that the porthole was wide open. I had not noticed it when I went to bed, and the stateroom was damp, too. Damp, said he. Whereabouts are you? One hundred and five. To my surprise, the doctor started visibly and stared at me. What is the matter? I asked. 
Oh, nothing, he answered. Only everybody has complained of that stateroom for the last three trips. I shall complain too, I said. It has certainly not been properly aired. It is a shame. I don't believe it can be helped, answered the doctor. I believe there is something, well, it is not my business to frighten passengers. You need not be afraid of frightening me, I replied. I can stand any amount of damp. If I should get a bad cold, I will come to you. I offered the doctor a cigar, which he took and examined very critically. It is not so much the damp, he remarked. However, I dare say you will get on very well. Have you a roommate? Yes, a deuce of a fellow who bolts out in the middle of the night and leaves the door open. Again, the doctor glanced curiously at me. Then he lit the cigar and looked grave. Did he come back? He asked presently. Yes, I was asleep, but I waked up and heard him moving. Then I felt cold and went to sleep again. This morning I found the porthole open. Look here, said the doctor quietly. I don't care much for this ship. I don't care a rap for her reputation. I tell you what I will do. I have a good-sized place up here. I will share it with you, though I don't know you from Adam. I was very much surprised at the proposition. I could not imagine why he would take such a sudden interest in my welfare. However, his manner as he spoke of the ship was peculiar. You are very good, doctor, I said. But really, I believe even now the cabin could be aired or cleaned out or something. Why do you not care for the ship? We are not superstitious in our profession, sir, replied the doctor. But the sea makes people so. I don't want to prejudice you, and I don't want to frighten you, but if you will take my advice, you will move in here. I would as soon see you overboard, he added, as know that you or any other man was to sleep in 105. Good gracious, why? I asked. Just because on the last three trips the people who have slept there actually have gone overboard, he answered gravely. The intelligence was startling, and exceedingly unpleasant, I confess. I looked hard at the doctor to see whether he was making game of me, but he looked perfectly serious. I thanked him warmly for his offer, but told him I intended to be the exception to the rule by which everyone who slept in that particular stateroom went overboard. He did not say much, but looked as grave as ever, and hinted that before we got across, I should probably reconsider his proposal. In the course of time, we went to breakfast, at which only an inconsiderable number of passengers assembled. I noticed that one or two of the officers who breakfasted with us looked grave. After breakfast, I went into my stateroom in order to get a book. The curtains of the upper berth were still closely drawn. Not a word was to be heard. My roommate was probably still asleep. As I came out, I met the steward, whose business it was to look after me. He whispered that the captain wanted to see me, and then scuttled away down the passage, as if very anxious to avoid any questions. I went towards the captain's cabin, and found him waiting for me. Sir, said he, I want to ask a favor of you. I answered that I would do anything to oblige him. Your roommate has disappeared, he said. He is known to have turned in early last night. Did you notice anything extraordinary in his manner? The question coming as it did, in exact confirmation of the fears the doctor had expressed half an hour earlier, staggered me. You don't mean to say he's gone overboard? I asked. I fear he has, answered the captain. This is the most extraordinary thing, I began. Why? he asked. He is the fourth, then? I explained. In answer to another question from the captain, I explained, without mentioning the doctor, that I had heard the story concerning 105. He seemed very much annoyed at hearing that I knew of it. I told him what had occurred in the night. What you say, he replied, 
coincides almost exactly with what was told me by the roommates of two of the other three. They bolt out of bed and run down the passage. Two of them were seen to go overboard by the watch. We stopped and lowered the boats, but they were not found. Nobody, however, saw or heard the man who was lost last night, if he is really lost. The steward, who is a superstitious fellow, perhaps, and expected something to go wrong, went to look for him this morning and found his berth empty, but his clothes lying about just as he had left them. The steward was the only man on board who knew him by sight, and he has been searching everywhere for him. He has disappeared. Now, sir, I want to beg you not to mention the circumstances to any of the passengers. I don't want the ship to get a bad name, and nothing hangs about an ocean-goer like stories of suicides. You shall have your choice of any one of the officer's cabins you like, including my own, for the rest of the passage. Is that a fair bargain? Very, said I, and I am much obliged to you, but since I am alone and have the stateroom to myself, I would rather not move. If the steward will take out that unfortunate man's things, I would as leave stay where I am. I will not say anything about the matter, and I think I can promise you that I will not follow my roommate. The captain tried to dissuade me from my intention, but I preferred having a stateroom alone to being the chum of any officer on board. I do not know whether I acted foolishly, but if I had taken his advice, I should have had nothing more to tell. There would have remained the disagreeable coincidence of several suicides occurring among men who had slept in the same cabin, but that would have been all. That was not the end of the matter, however, by any means. I obstinately made up my mind that I would not be disturbed by such tales, and I even went so far as to argue the question with the captain. There was something wrong about the stateroom, I said. It was rather damp. The porthole had been left open last night. My roommate might have been ill when he came on board, and he might have become delirious after he went to bed. He might even now be hiding somewhere on board, and might be found later. The place ought to be aired and the fastening of the port looked to. If the captain would give me leave, I would see that what I thought necessary were done immediately. Of course you have a right to stay where you are if you please, he replied, rather petulantly. But I would wish you would turn out and let me lock the place up and be done with it. I did not see it in the same light and left the captain after promising to be silent concerning the disappearance of my companion. The latter had had no acquaintances on board and was not missed in the course of the day. Towards evening I met the doctor again and he asked me whether I had changed my mind. I told him I had not. Then you will before long he said, very gravely. I hope you've enjoyed this tale of the dangers of the sea, and that you'll join me for the conclusion in the next episode. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Tonight's story was written by Francis Marion Crawford. Thanks for listening. Good night. <laughs>